Yet there are elements in the Congress who would mandate more severe strictness of political affiliation or geographic location. And I don't like double. No. We'll consume more than $2 billion each week this year. $117 billion for interest payments. $117 billion which will produce nothing. Opportunity. No health care, no no hope for the downtrodden and the poor. The sorrows and the deprivations that people are now encountering are a result, allegedly, by every measure. It was the most successful tournament we've ever held and one of the largest and most successful promotions for the state of Alabama and the city of Montgomery. Uh, we've never had anything like uh, the thousands of people that poured in here from all over the, uh, all over the country, really, and particularly in the Montgomery area. It was, a, it was a marvelous thing. It was clean. It was decent. Uh, people who love fishing could be a part of what was happening. And I might add, a lot of people in Montgomery in the area that are not really fishermen came and became a part of this whole program. It was just a marvelous week. Montgomery's Representative Bob McKee offered the resolution that would turn down the judge's request for increases ranging from 18 to 33 percent. Under state law, the judge's recommendation becomes effective automatically if the legislature doesn't reject it. It's now up to the Senate to decide if it wants to join the House in rejecting the increases. Even though a current bill giving state employees a 14 percent pay hike doesn't appear to include judges, there are some amendments ready to include them, and there are almost a half a dozen other employee pay raise bills, some of which include the judges. Meanwhile, a disagreement between two Tuscaloosa County representatives over a liquor bill for that county tied up the House today, delaying one more time a vote by the House on a bill combining a 16 percent teacher pay raise with a 14 percent employee pay raise. Education forces say they're just being patient about the final vote, while some other legislators say they're beginning to make some headway in diluting the education supporters into going back to a 14 percent teacher salary increase and a 10 percent employee raise. The Senate started to work on a 28 sunset bills, continuing a number of state agencies, but the Senate only acted on two of them, one being the State Nursing Board, which originally was in line for some drastic changes, but under the eye of some nurses in the gallery, the Senate voted to keep the Nursing Board intact. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Barnhart talked Reaganomics from start to finish in a fiery attack on any and all who opposed the Reagan economic plan. Barnhart stayed close to what is now standard fare for Reagan supporters, blaming past administrations and private interest groups for many of the economic woes the nation faces. And yet the critics would say, return to the great old policies of the past, the good old days of a couple years ago, when inflation went from 6.2% under Jerry Ford to 12.6 percent under Mr. Carter. But Barnhart was tough on private industry too, saying lack of participation in government by private industry allowed what he called social climbers to get just what they wanted. Now he says it will be hard to break the habit of handing responsibility to the federal government. Later in the day, Governor Fob James put in his own good words for the Reagan White House, making it clear once again that even though he and the president come from opposing political parties, they are at least today thinking many of the same political thoughts. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News.
There were 87 marchers this afternoon when they reached the spot where Mrs. Liuzzo was gunned down in 1965. Her son, Tony, who started marching yesterday, placed the wreath in memory of his mother. He tearfully listened as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. Joseph Lowry, described his mother as a brave and gallant woman. Then Tony Liuzzo had his own statement to make. The spirit of my mother, of Dr. King, and of every brave soul that laid down their life for freedom lives inside of us today. We will pick up their tracks on this pavement, this very pavement that they once marched, and go on to Montgomery and go on further all across the nation to say we shall be free and we shall overcome one day. The marchers place palm leaf crosses around the wreath. One woman laid three crosses, one for knowing Mrs. Liuzzo, the second for rooming with her, and the third for the life she gave for the civil rights movement. After a prayer and freedom songs, the marchers continued down Highway 80. Tomorrow, they'll go to Lounsboro, then continue on to Montgomery, where they'll spend the night at St. Jude. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. I'm not going to make any attempts to assume what that reason was. Merely now is that we have it in our hands. Mr. Avenue, we felt like we had a historic mark. We felt like we had a reason for coming to Montgomery. Listen, in on item number six, okay, <coughs> fifth motion carried and the resolution has been passed. Members of council, anything you Earlier this year, a committee of judges recommended their salaries be increased between eight and $11,000 each. This increase would also include the attorney general and district attorneys. And under the current state law, unless the legislature says no, the increases go into effect automatically at the end of the session, costing the state $1.6 million extra dollars this year. Next year, the state would have to fork out an extra $3.9 million over and above current levels to meet the new salaries. Today, Representative Bob McKee of Montgomery offered a resolution saying no to the judge's recommendation. Although the House agreed with McKee and passed his resolution, the Senate must decide to do the same in order to stop the pay raises from going into effect. The legislature isn't entirely against judges getting a salary increase. There are several bills tying the judges to the state employees' 10 or 14 percent pay raise. But the process has at least one senator upset. Senator Bishop Barron has a bill that would switch the process and require the legislature to say yes for the recommended increases to go into effect. Under Barron's bill, if the legislature didn't do anything to the recommendation, then the judges would not get a pay raise. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Viola Liuzzo's fourth child, Tony, carried a wreath to mark the spot where his mother was shot and killed in 1965. Mrs. Liuzzo was gunned down, carrying marchers in her personal car back and forth between Selma and Montgomery during the voting rights march 17 years ago. The spirit of my mother, of Dr. King, and of every brave soul that laid down their life for freedom lives inside of us today. We will pick up their tracks on this pavement, this very pavement that they once marched, and go on to Montgomery, and go on further all across the nation to say we shall be free, and we shall overcome one day. Each marcher placed a cross made from palm leaves around the reef. One said she worked with Mrs. Liuzzo. One for having known her, one for having lived with us, and one for the sacrifice of her life. After a prayer and freedom songs, the group paused to reflect on the slain civil rights worker and to look ahead to the issues involved in the current voting rights march. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News.
The trial didn't begin until Twinkle is on trial on one of two counts of first-degree murder. He's charged in the execution-style shooting deaths of Magic Mart employee Larry Dominguez and 7-Eleven clerk Andy Adams. Both were killed in separate robberies in the early morning hours of July 26. William Bush, a co-defendant, was sentenced to death in November for his conviction on the same charges. After hearing testimony from 13 witnesses this afternoon, prosecutors came back following a supper break with six more witnesses. Of the six was Officer T.H. Roper of the Montgomery Police Department who was involved in the interrogation of Pringle when he was arrested in August. The prosecution submitted both a written and tape-recorded confession by Pringle. The 35-minute tape was played in the courtroom. On the tape, Pringle recalled the events of the night of the robberies. He said he and William Bush decided to rob the stores because they needed money for drugs and said he and Bush had been using cocaine and marijuana earlier that night. He further stated that during both robberies, Bush pulled the trigger while he searched for money. Pringle admitted taking a payroll check which belonged to Andy Adams. He said only about 30 or 40 dollars in cash was taken from the 7-Eleven store where Adams was killed. Pringle continued on the tape by saying he tried to cash the payroll check the next day, but was unable to when a grocery store manager became suspicious and called police. One of the last witnesses to take the stand tonight was Andy Adams' wife, Carol, who was visibly shaken and very nervous. She was asked to identify the stolen payroll check, which she did, at the same time choking back the tears. The prosecution rested its case after presenting a total of 19 witnesses. The defense will have its turn tomorrow. From the Montgomery County Courthouse, Dan Black, WSFA TV News. We're in the Fender Aid organization, seven state offenders in the state of Alabama, and eight. And all, all seven by New Year's. Does my days and nights mixed up. I can't sleep at night. And I... <laughs> and all, all seven by New Year's. The state has $449 million in its treasury from the Oil East windfall money. An interest on that principal will amount to $57 million by March 1st. An additional $70 million will be earned by March 1st, 1983. But the legislature has already appropriated $65 million of that money for construction and renovation of mental health facilities and $45 million for construction of new prisons, with another $20 million appropriation possible. Under current state law, no further appropriations can be made from the oil money until 1984, when more interest has accrued. But Governor James wants to make some major improvements, and that takes more money than is available. This amendment would allow the state to adopt a plan to make full use of the money, but still save the principal by selling $520 million in general obligation bonds and depositing the net proceeds. Some of the projects the money would be used for include renovating classrooms or building new classrooms in grades K through 12, widening and repairing bridges and highways, deepening the Mobile Ship Channel, and repairing and renovating the State Coliseum. Gina Gregory, WSFA-TV News, at the Capitol. Reverend Lowry says he had considered the possibility of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference going to federal court to try and reverse the council's ruling, but later he decided another action would be more effective. He decided if we went to federal court, then we would in a sense be saying we put ourselves in your hands, and we would have kind of been bound by what they say. Mama. So the Lord said, yes, yes, all right. Yes, sir. 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 Yes
Yeah. But we did not act because the Lord had to say. All right. But now the Lord has said. Yes. yes. And the Lord said, Joseph, yes. yes. come on, doctor. Say to the black councilman, yes. yes. right. y'all lost the fight. Why don't y'all go to federal court? Come on. <laughs> After leaving the Mount Sinai Baptist Church, the marchers rode into the city limits. Then at Danley Field, they left the cars and vans and went the rest of the way on foot. A number of Montgomery police officers waited for the group to reach Western Electric Company. Once there, the responsibility of the marchers was transferred from the state to the city. By four this afternoon, the marchers had reached St. Jude. Tonight, they'll gather at the Lilly Baptist Church, where they'll receive further instructions for tomorrow's march to the Capitol steps. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. It was a case of appearances deceiving. What appeared to be the problem was a possible conflict of interest on Wallace's part. Several commissioners suggested that, as an advisor to the governor, Wallace could perhaps sway executive decisions, such as budget proposals, in favor of the university he represents. But because Wallace, as an advisor, is a public official, without direct authority to receive or spend state money, that point moved beyond the guidelines of the ethics law and was passed on to the attorney general's office. It was then that the commission realized there was still a problem. Though Wallace is a public official at the governor's office, at UAB, he is a public employee, and state ethics laws prohibit a public employee from being paid by the executive branch of government for advice. One problem the commission faced was a lack of precedent for the case. The only former governors who serve as advisors are Wallace and Jim Folsom Sr., and because Wallace is the only one classified as a public employee, he's the only one the commission's decision will affect. The commission decided Wallace can't accept the $18,000 for advising the governor but only because it deals with the executive branch of state government, not because UAB could benefit from his advice. It was, as one commissioner suggested, a decision based on ethics law, not necessarily on ethics. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News in Auburn. The defense was to have presented its witnesses this morning as the second day of the trial got underway. But Pringle's attorney, Jerry Cruz, had none to offer to the court and instead rested his case. Moments later, closing arguments were presented by both sides, and at 1045, the jury went into the deliberation. At noon, they broke for lunch, and a little over an hour later, returned to continue deliberations. Finally, at 2.30, the verdict was returned, guilty of capital murder as charged. After a short recess, Judge Joseph Phelps instructed the jury of 10 whites and two blacks on the sentencing hearing, which under Alabama's new code must be performed immediately following the normal trial procedure. At that time, both the prosecution led by Deputy District Attorneys Mike Broom and Lewis Gillis and the defense presented further evidence in the case. Broom introduced certified copies of Pringle's seven previous robbery convictions in Florida. Later, Edward Pringle took the stand for the defense, at which time he admitted to his involvement in both of the Montgomery convenience store robberies, but at the same time said he had nothing to do with the shootings of the two clerks, Larry Dominguez and Andy Adams. While on the stand, he began crying and further stated that he had been on drugs and said he had slipped into a stage of hallucination and was not really aware that the men had been shot. At the same time, under cross-examination, Assistant D.A. Broom said Pringle was just as guilty as William Bush, his co-defendant who was sentenced to die in November for his conviction in the case. After being charged by Judge Phelps, the jury again left to decide the penalty. At 4.35, the verdict was returned. The vote was 10 to 2, life without parole. After the verdict was read, Pringle was led from the courtroom by deputies. He had no comment for reporters. Formal sentencing is set for March 3rd. Carol Adams, the wife of Andy Adams, the man in which Pringle was convicted of killing, said she is glad the trial is over, but says it won't bring Andy back. Dan Black, WSFA TV News. The commission's decision came after a long discussion about possible conflict of interest on Wallace's behalf. The idea was that Wallace could possibly sway executive decisions such as budget proposals to benefit the university he works for. But because Wallace served the governor as a public official with no authority to spend or receive state money, the commission said no conflict of interest existed. The commission was concerned, however, that Wallace, as a program director at UAB, is a public employee. State ethics laws prohibit public employees from being paid to advise the executive branch of government. It was that law that prompted the commission's ruling. If he wishes, Wallace can challenge the ruling in circuit court. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News in Auburn. 
Therefore, I certainly think that given me the experience, I was elected as Commissioner of Public Works in 1966 for the City of Montgomery. I will work and cooperate with the commissioners of Elmo County, with the Sheriff's Department, and the other county officials throughout Elmo County. And I will work and cooperate with the five cities that we have in Elmo County. And by God's help and the good citizens' help of Elmo County, I certainly would like to be your probate judge, and I humbly solicit your support. Well, it should have a motivating uh, effect because we played um, very well down there in a lot of areas and actually should have won the game. And some of the things that we did late in the ball game cost us the ball game as much as that 35-foot shot or 45-foot shot, whatever it was. But I think it will be a motivator because it, it makes them realize that they can play with them. The jury of 10 whites and two blacks deliberated for nearly three hours before returning the guilty verdict against 28-year-old Edward Pringle. Pringle was convicted for his involvement in the robbery and murder of 7-Eleven employee Andy Adams, who was gone down in the early morning hours of July 26. Pringle's co-defendant, William Bush, was convicted and sentenced to die in the electric chair in November for killing Magic Mart employee Larry Dominguez. Both young men were murdered execution style in two separate incidents on the same morning. Their motive for the robberies and killings, according to Pringle, was to buy drugs. Today, during his sentencing hearing, Pringle took the stand on his own behalf and admitted he was involved in the two convenience store robberies, but said it was Bush that shot and killed the two men. He further stated, while under cross-examination, that he was outside when both shootings occurred and was not really aware the men had been killed. He said he was on drugs and his mind had slipped into hallucination, which prevented him from being in touch with reality. Assistant District Attorney Lewis Gillis told the court that Pringle was just as guilty as Bush because he drove the getaway car and also split the $40 in cash taken from the 7-Eleven store. While Pringle was on the stand, Assistant District Attorney Mike Broom introduced certified copies of seven previous robbery convictions against Pringle from Florida in 1974. While testifying, Pringle broke into tears when the defense attorney, Jerry Cruz, asked him if he believed in violence. Pringle said no. After the sentencing hearing, the jury adjourned. Fifty minutes later, at 4.35 p.m., the verdict was returned, life without parole. The vote was 10 to 2. Pringle, who sat motionless when the verdict was read, still faces a second count of murder for the death of Larry Dominguez. Formal sentencing for Pringle has been set for March 3rd. From the Montgomery County Courthouse, Dan Black, WSFA TV News. Joe Reed, Mark Gilmore, and Donald Watkins, all members of the city council, filed the suit on behalf of the marchers. Judge Varner met behind closed doors with the three, along with other city council members, city attorneys, and police chief Charles Swindle for more than two hours before reaching a decision. Judge Varner says at this late hour, it's improper for him to disturb a ruling made by the city fathers on the march route. He says evidence indicates the city hasn't allowed other groups to march through the business district and the ruling on the march route was consistent. He says the Merchants Association filed an objection to the march going through downtown and the judge says he understands their position. Varner also denied Swindle's request for an injunction to prevent the marchers from detouring from the parade route, but Varner says he's not licensing the marchers to violate the law. Gina Gregory, WSFA-TV News at the Federal Courthouse. March coordinator Leon Hall called Mayor Emery Farmer a madman because the five white members of the Montgomery City Council voted against the marcher's request to walk the original Dexter Avenue route. Thank God Almighty 
that there's a mad man, a small man, a weasel in Montgomery, Alabama, by the name of Emory Farmer, who thinks that in 1982, he can stand in our way and treat us like we're boys. We came to tell him, we came to tell the governor of Alabama, we came to tell Ronald Reagan, we are gonna let anybody turn us around. Paul challenged Montgomeryans to clean house during the upcoming election by voting for and electing others to do the job. The marchers will assemble at St. Jude tomorrow at 9 a.m. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA, TV News. And we need you here and as you get... Early in the game from Auburn, it looked as though LSU would dominate. They were penetrating inside. Leonard Mitchell playing despite a bad ankle scores here. He had 16. Howard High C. Carter was high man for the Bengals with 20. He hits here from long range. But Auburn caught fire. They outscored LSU 25 to 10 in the first eight minutes of the second half to erase a five-point halftime deficit and take a nine-point lead. The duo of Charles Barkley and Odell Mosteller ignited Auburn, both having their best games as Tigers. Barkley scoring 19-2 here inside. He also had seven blocked shots, a school record. There he rejects Mitchell. To add to that, he also pulled down 17 rebounds. Mosteller scored a career-high 23 to lead all scores. He hits here inside. Auburn beats LSU 82-72. The Tigers improve to 6-9 in the SEC. LSU falls to 10-5. Reporting from Auburn, Rick Ponds, WSFA TV Sports. The money would come from the general fund of the state, specifically from the oil and gas lease funds. It would be used to pay the cost incurred by the state in providing services to the Alabama Housing Finance Authority, which is coordinating $200 million in bonds for home mortgages. The amendment states that the money would be certain, that is, no doubt of its availability. The amendment would also allow the Housing Authority to issue bonds for the purpose of making funds available in the state for mortgage loans on single and multifamily residential property at low interest rates. The legislature, in its findings, said there's a critical shortage of funds for such mortgage loans. If the amendment passes, the money would be used for paying fees charged by lending institutions for financing those mortgages. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. Before the march started today, Black City Councilmen, march coordinators, and city officials reached a compromise that allowed the marchers to walk two more blocks up Dexter Avenue. March leaders were opposed to the original route because it didn't trace the 1965 march up Dexter. Some of the leaders hinted that they might follow the 1965 route. Montgomery police were expecting some trouble. The march officials cautioned the crowd to keep it peaceful, and they asked the marchers to leave all weapons, even fingernail files, behind. The march left St. Jude 30 minutes behind schedule with over 1,000 participants. Earlier, march coordinators had asked all of Montgomery to join in walking, in wheelchairs, or even on crutches. There were a number of elderly people who went along the route, while some had to stand by and watch. As time progressed, some of the bystanders joined in. When the marchers reached the corner of Clayton and Goldthwaite Street, a line of Montgomery police was there to prevent them from going the original route. But all the marchers turned right and moved along Clayton Street. The compromise route allowed them to turn left on Perry, then right on Dexter, allowing them to walk two additional blocks on Dexter Avenue. At Dexter Avenue, hundreds of bystanders were ready to greet the marchers, and most fell in and walked the remaining blocks to the Capitol. Kim Davis has more on the rally that followed.
Law enforcement officials gathered this morning at the Montgomery Civic Center, which was used as a staging area. Police Chief Charles Swindle ordered the change in the parade route before the marchers left St. Jude. Swindle says his decision to change the route down Perry Street was a tactical move to ensure the safety of the marchers and the citizens of Montgomery and did not consider it a compromise with the leaders of the march. The focal point of the march was a five points area where marchers would either follow the parade route down Clayton Street or cross police barricades and follow the route taken in 1965. The crowd watching the marchers cheered as the first group of demonstrators turned the corner down Clayton Street. But a handful of marchers didn't give up easily on their idea of following the original parade route. But they too turned the corner at the request of march officials and police. The only incident police reported took place about an hour before marchers reached the Five Points area when two white males were arrested for carrying several knives. The parade went on down Clayton Street to Perry to Dexter, all under heavy security. And the march ended here. After all the rhetoric of what could be and what might be, there were no confrontations. The march ended the way it started out, a peaceful demonstration, a credit both to law enforcement officials and the marchers. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. The marchers arrived on the Capitol steps around 1 o'clock. They were greeted by a small, supportive crowd, which soon swelled to more than 3,000. The demonstrators carried signs with a mandate to national and state leaders, urged Congress to pass a strong, extended Voting Rights Act, and free Maggie Bozeman and Julia Wilder. Most of the speakers were black elected officials from across Alabama who reminded the crowd that they would not be in office without the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Legislation to extend that act is currently pending before the U.S. Senate. California Congressman Don Edwards All promised right. to carry the demonstrators' message back to Washington. We want the same bill passed in the Senate of the United States. We want no changes in it, especially we do not want the change that President Reagan is trying to get through, which would destroy portions of the bill and make it weaker than the bill that we first passed in 1965. Dr. Martin Luther yeah. King Sr., whose son led the 1965 Selma to Montgomery March, told the crowd of rich and poor, employed and jobless, black and white, and young and old, that his son's movement is still alive. Anybody who says that Martin Luther King Jr. is dead, there's something wrong with him. Come on, yes, sir. Come on, Dr. Yes, 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 Work with him, Dr. Yes, 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 he still lives. Yes, 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 yes. He died for what he said. Yeah. Group leaders say today's rally is far Into from over. Senate. Southern Christian leadership if conference they president heard Dr. Our Joseph message Lowry, who spearheaded Carrollton the Carrollton to Montgomery March, to says the group may next take their message in person to the Capitol steps in Washington. But first, Lowry says there's still work to do at the state level. After the two-hour rally, leaders met with Governor James to discuss their strategy, and Chris Grimshaw has more on the meeting with the governor. While the marchers rallied outside the Capitol, Governor James worked in his office preparing for a meeting with a group of the protesters. The group, headed by SCLC President Dr. Joseph Lowry, Birmingham Mayor Richard Arrington, and several state representatives, wanted James to support the Voting Rights Act. The protesters say they are aware that the governor doesn't have any legal options in changing the convictions of the two Pickens County women. Thirteen people made it in to see the governor, where they spent about 45 minutes talking in generalities about the Voting Rights Act. He favored the Voting Rights Act. He favored its extension. He simply said he had some question about uh, the, the provisions uh, that applied only to southern states and that he would study S-1992. Lowry says they didn't talk specifically about the governor's support of President Reagan's version of the Voting Rights Act, which the protesters feel is a diluted version. But Lowry says the governor promised to study the act that they're interested in having extended before making any commitment to act as a leader in their cause. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, in the governor's office. Representative Charles Langford of Montgomery offered the series of bills that would increase the salaries for seven locally elected officials. Langford's bill would raise the salary of the tax collector and tax assessor from $27,500 to $35,000 a year. 
The Montgomery County probate judge's salary would be changed from $27,500 to 90% of the salary paid circuit judges, which in this case would be about $40,000. And Langford's last bill would provide the county's three district judges with a county supplement of $11,500 to be added to the $29,500 they're being paid by the state. Those three district judges now get $3,500 as a supplement from the county. The controversial point on these pay raises is the time the raises would become effective. Langford's bill currently reads that the raises would go into effect immediately. But Senator Bishop Barron says he'll change the effective date to the next term of office. The county delegation will hold a public hearing on these bills next Tuesday at the state capitol. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News at the capitol. I'm here also because I am very fond of this city and I come back every chance I see during the recent days. It might uh, not be to your liking, but uh, now being businessmen, businesswomen, I don't have to tell you what kind of position you would be in if you had to operate at a 10 to 20 percent disadvantage. You couldn't stand it very long. There's not that much profit in it. So that is a little bit, that gives you some idea about our competition. night as Alabama State visited Tuskegee for the first time in eight years and the Golden Tigers responded by routing the Hornets 118 to 90. Tuskegee could do no wrong. They hit 71 percent from the field led by senior David Trench game high 32 off the bench. Many were from long range just like that. 
For the Hornets, nothing seemed to go right. They committed numerous turnovers, many resulting in Tiger buckets. This Sam Drenson slam dunk off the steel brought the capacity crowd to their feet. It was typical of the kind of night it would be for Alabama State. You know, they had a situation where they really got going, and, you know, everything they shot went in the bash, and you shoot seven and one for six consistently. You know, you'll score that many points, and, uh, you know, we weren't doing a good job playing defense, and it was just a bad game on our part. And at the same time, they're having the, probably the best game they've had in the last few years. So, you know, it's a combination of those things and 28-point difference. Alabama State will attempt to regroup this Saturday night in a crucial contest with Tougaloo at Dunn Arena. It's a designated NAIA District 27 contest, and a win will give the Hornets the district crown as well as the home court advantage throughout the district playoffs. Oliver assured me there would be no thoughts of Tuskegee come Saturday night. Rick Pons, WSFA TV Sports. It was a peaceful march, threatened with violence in its final day. Some marchers said they would not follow the city council parade route. Members of the Ku Klux Klan had planned a counter demonstration, but concessions were made and there was no violence. The Five Points area was a point where marchers would either follow the city approved parade route or cross police barricades and take the 1965 route. Blacks and whites watching the march cheered as the first group of marchers hesitated and then turned the corner. A handful of other marchers wanted to go straight, but they too turned the corner and went on peacefully. One man watching as the protesters made their way to the Capitol was Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, Don Black. He and about 25 of his members made concessions too. Well, right now we're just observing. We had originally considered uh, some sort of counter demonstration, but after having been asked by the police uh, uh, not to come here as a group because they felt it might result in some type of confrontation, which we certainly did not want, and we did not want to add to the uh, police problems that uh, they're already facing, uh, we have decided to uh, conduct our own march at a later date. There's no doubt that the march could have gone the way of violence. But today, cool heads prevail. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. They came by the hundreds. Some came just to see what a civil rights march is all about. Some say they weren't disappointed. Many, like Dr. Joseph Bradford, remember the 1965 Selma to Montgomery march? He came on a train from Washington to take part. Today, he looked on. What does today's march mean to you? Well, you can't help but wonder how much progress we have made. We, we, see, that march resulted in the Voting Rights Act being passed. And today it's frightening to realize that there are forces in this country that want to take the very heart out of that. Uh, legislation. Jeffrey Bankhead's parents remember the events of the 60s. Grade, Jeffrey was just a boy when the Voting Rights Act was oh, yes, passed, yes, yes. and now he wants it extended. What does it mean to you? The Voters' Rights March means that we're here today to break down some of the barriers of racial inequality in America. Demonstrators believe their message will be carried to Washington. Supporters say they don't know how their message will be received, but they hope the congressional and state leaders will respond favorably, especially in this election year. Don Phelps has more on today's march. Governor James worked in his office this afternoon as the marchers rallied outside his window. A group of 13 protesters met with the governor later for 45 minutes. They were asking for support from the governor for their twofold cause. First, free the two Pickens County women convicted of vote fraud. He urged uh, expedient pursuit of this matter through the pardon and parole board. Uh, and SCLC President Joseph Lowry says they sought his support for the extension of the Voting Rights Act. He said he had not studied S-1992 but committed himself to study it to determine whether or not he could give it its full support in, in detail. But he did support the principle. But Lowry says Governor James had some reservations about the Voting Rights Act only applying to 13 southern states. We did uh, make it clear to him that because of history, historical reasons, uh, one had to expect certain uh, provisions uh, to zero in on uh, the, the, the sickness 
uh, from its source. Lowry says they also asked the governor to support a bill in the state senate that would set up a method of re-identifying voters in the state. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, in the governor's office. Why do flies have wings? The Voters' Right Act should be reenacted, and I think that we we accomplished uh, these things. I think we dramatized that, and that's what we sought to do. So we are not stopping at this, but we are going to continue. And one thing that I want to make it clear to all of our people. In Montgomery, we do have a coalition, and that means that there are other organizations, all of us working together to try to make it so. And I know that if we work together, we will be able to accomplish what we're trying to do. WSFA Television, Montgomery. From Alabama's News Center, this is the WSFA TV News 6 o'clock report. Good evening, I'm Bob Howell, and this is the news for February 18th. Civil rights supporters who marched and rode 160 miles from Carrollton ended their journey today on the steps of the state capitol building in Montgomery. When they began 12 days ago, only a handful of marchers moved out along the rural highways leading to Montgomery. But when they arrived today, they were thousands strong. And despite some last-minute disagreement over what route the marchers should follow into downtown Montgomery, the march came off without incident. Here's what happened. Before the march started today, black city councilmen, march coordinators, and city officials reached a compromise that allowed the marchers to walk two more blocks up Dexter Avenue. March leaders were opposed to the original route because it didn't trace the 1965 march up Dexter. Some of the leaders hinted that they might follow the 1965 route. Montgomery police were expecting some trouble, but march officials cautioned the crowd to keep it peaceful, and they asked the marchers to leave all weapons, even fingernail files, behind. The march left St. Jude 30 minutes behind schedule with over a thousand participants. Earlier, march coordinators had asked all of Montgomery to join in walking, in wheelchairs, or even on crutches. There were a number of elderly people who went along the route, while some had to stand by and watch. As time progressed, some of the bystanders joined in. When the marchers reached the corner of Clayton and Gothway Street, a line of Montgomery police was there to prevent them from going the original route. But all the marchers turned right and moved along Clayton Street. The compromise route allowed them to turn left on Perry, then right on Dexter, allowing them to walk two additional blocks on Dexter Avenue. At Dexter Avenue, hundreds of bystanders were ready to greet the marchers, and most fell in and walked the remaining blocks to the Capitol. Kim Davis has more on the rally that followed. The marchers arrived on the Capitol steps around 1 o'clock. They were greeted by a small, supportive crowd, which soon swelled to more than 3,000. The demonstrators carried signs with a mandate to national and state leaders, urged Congress to pass a strong, extended Voting Rights Act, and free Maggie Bozeman and Julia Wilder. 
Most of the speakers were black elected officials from across Alabama who reminded the crowd that they would not be in office without the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Legislation to extend that act is currently pending before the U.S. Senate. California Congressman Don Edwards promised right. to carry the demonstrators' message back to Washington. We want the same bill passed in the Senate of the United States. We want no changes in it, especially we do not want the change that President Reagan is trying to get through, which would destroy portions of the bill and make it weaker than the bill that we first passed in 1965. Got him! Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., whose son led the 1965 Selma to Montgomery March, told the crowd of rich and poor, employed and jobless, black and white, and young and old, that his son's movement is still alive. Anybody who says that Martin Luther King Jr. is dead, there's something wrong with him. Come on, Doctor. He still lives. Yes. Yes. He died for what he said. Yeah. Group leaders say today's rally is far from over. Southern Christian Leadership if Conference President Dr. Dr. Joseph Lowry, who spearheaded the Carrollton to Montgomery March, says the group may next take their message in person to the Capitol steps in Washington. But first, Lowry says there's still work to do at the state level. After the two-hour rally, leaders met with Governor James to discuss their strategy, and Chris Grimshaw has more on the meeting with the governor. While the marchers rallied outside the Capitol, Governor James worked in his office preparing for a meeting with a group of the protesters. The group, headed by SCLC President Dr. Joseph Lowry, Birmingham Mayor Richard Arrington, and several state representatives, wanted James to support the Voting Rights Act. The protesters say they are aware that the governor doesn't have any legal options in changing the convictions of the two Pickens County women. Thirteen people made it in to see the governor, where they spent about 45 minutes talking in generalities about the Voting Rights Act. He favored the Voting Rights Act. He favored its extension. He simply said he had some question about uh, the, the provisions uh, that applied only to southern states and that he would study S-1992. Lowry says they didn't talk specifically about the governor's support of President Reagan's version of the Voting Rights Act, which the protesters feel is a diluted version. But Lowry says the governor promised to study the act that they're interested in having extended before making any commitment to act as a leader in their cause. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, in the governor's office. Security was extremely tight today. About 250 policemen were called in to ensure the safety of the marchers and to make sure that there were no serious disturbances or incidents along the way. Don Phelps has more on preparations made by police today. Law enforcement officials gathered this morning at the Montgomery Civic Center, which was used as a staging area. Police Chief Charles Swindle ordered the change in the parade route before the marchers left St. Jude. Swindle says his decision to change the route down Perry Street was a tactical move to ensure the safety of the marchers and the citizens of Montgomery and did not consider it a compromise with the leaders of the march. The focal point of the march was a five points area where marchers would either follow the parade route down Clayton Street or cross police barricades and follow the route taken in 1965. The crowd watching the marchers cheered as the first group of demonstrators turned the corner down Clayton Street. But a handful of marchers didn't give up easily on their idea of following the original parade route. But they, too, turned the corner at the request of march officials and police. The only incident police reported took place about an hour before marchers reached the Five Points area, when two white males were arrested for carrying several knives. The parade went on, down Clayton Street, to Perry, to Dexter, all under heavy security. <laughs> And the march ended here. After all the rhetoric of what could be and what might be, there were no confrontations. The march ended the way it started out, a peaceful demonstration. I credit both to law enforcement officials and the marchers. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. And tonight, editorial director Bob Ingram has some thoughts about today's march in Montgomery. The last line of our editorial last night closed with these words, and I quote, we have no doubt that tomorrow's march and demonstration will be conducted without incident because that's the way the people of Montgomery, black and white, insist that it be done. And that's the way it was. The marchers exercise their right of peaceful protest. Most Montgomerians exercise their right of peaceful disinterest. Had we written the script, it could not have gone smoother. There were no incidents of any consequence, no unpleasantness. It was a wonderfully calm affair. 
the one troublesome issue which yesterday threatened to provoke a confrontation, the route of the parade in downtown Montgomery, was resolved in a manner which placated both sides. Apparently, Montgomery Police Chief Charles Swindle was the man most responsible for resolving this dispute. If so, he deserves a salute from all of us. But our strongest commendation goes to those who marched and those who didn't, for they are the ones who made this day what it was. It's a funny thing. Early today, it was cloudy and gloomy and threatening, but it turned out to be a beautiful day in Montgomery. And we're not simply talking about the weather. And that's the way we see it tonight. Coming up next, State Senator... Tonight, Editorial Director Bob Ingram has some thoughts about tomorrow's march to the state capitol. Montgomery has had more than its share of marches during the past 25 years. So many, in fact, that one more march isn't nearly the big deal to Montgomerians as it appears to be to those from without. Another march is scheduled for Montgomery tomorrow, and we are confident it will cause little or no interruption to business as usual in our city. There may be some minor traffic tie-ups, but that's a small price to pay to guarantee to those who march their constitutional right of peaceful protest. Make no mistake about it, those who have marched from Carrollton to Montgomery, those who will march to the Capitol tomorrow, have every right to do so. But no less sacred is the right of others, those who do not share the views of those who protest, to ignore the march. We would hope that is precisely what happens tomorrow. In all honesty, we deeply regret the dispute that has arisen concerning the route of the march in downtown Montgomery. And the indictment we return is against both sides, the leaders of the march and the Montgomery City Council. From Carrollton to the police jurisdiction of Montgomery, the avowed purpose of the march was to protest the convictions of two black women in Pickens County and to demonstrate support for the extension of the Voting Rights Act. But those two issues appear to have been shunted aside the issue now is whether the marchers can walk the full six blocks of Dexter Avenue or only three blocks. And the Montgomery City Council has contributed to this possible confrontation by declaring the first three blocks of Dexter Avenue off limits to the marchers. We had not been aware until yesterday that Dexter Avenue from Court Square Fountain to McDonough Street was hallowed ground to either side. What we perceive here are two opposing groups who share the same concern, that of saving face. But this ridiculous dispute notwithstanding, we have no doubt, we have no doubt at all that tomorrow's march and demonstration will be conducted without incident because that's the way the people of Montgomery, black and white, insists that it be done. And that's the way we see it tonight.